regardless of what cookies you're using, what user agent you put in, or what uh, headers you use, there is a method that anti-bot websites can figure out who you are and what your intentions probably are based on just a simple hash string. That hash string is called the JA3 hash and it's made up of the TLS information that happens when you make the initial request. So when we make an initial request to a server, there's a TLS handshake, a client hello, a server hello, and there's some information is shared. What I've got on the left hand side of my screen here is the TLS report from my Chrome browser and on the right is from HTTPX within Python. Now it's important to note that I use HTTPX here because because it's HTTP2 enabled, and I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit and why that's important too. When we start to use techniques like TLS spoofing, like we are here, we want to make sure that our IP meets the quality standard necessary, as this is another way for sites to decide to block our request. That's where I use the sponsor of today's video, ProxyScrape. ProxyScrape gives us access to high quality, secure, fast, and ethically sourced proxies that cover residential, data center, and mobile with rotating and sticky session options. There's 10 million plus proxies in the pool all to use, all with unlimited concurrent sessions from countries all over the globe, enabling us to scrape quickly and efficiently. My go-to is either geo-targeted residential proxies based on the location of the website, or the mobile proxies, as these are the best options for passing anti-bot protection on sites, and with auto-rotation or sticky sessions, along with one of the Python packages I'm going to cover later in this video, it's a great first step to avoid being blocked. It's still only one line of code to add to your project, and then we can let ProxyScrape handle the rest. And also, any traffic you purchase is yours to use whenever you need, as it doesn't ever expire. So if this all sounds good to you, go ahead and check out ProxyScrape at the link in the description below. Okay, let's check out the hash string and see what it means for our scrapers. So we can clearly see that these are different, but let's take, let's take a look at the JA3 hash first for each one, and they're obviously gonna be different here. Now this little string is a hash representation of the full string report here. And this is made up of various different bits of information. For example, 771 is the TLS version used, and then these represent the ciphers, and then there's some other information tagged on the end. What's important to know about this is that this information can be used to work out you know, what sort of request you've made, um, if it's come from a browser, if it's come from you know, HTTPX in this case, and it can be used to identify you and you can be blocked regardless of any other information. So let's go up, back up to the top and let's check out the ciphers because this is the biggest difference really. So straight away we can see the Chrome browser has much less ciphers enabled. These are the ciphers, the encryption that's decided upon and used when the TLS handshake takes place. On the right with HTTPX, there's lots more. Now clearly with this many more, we're gonna have much more information in that string, which is gonna to lead to a very, very unique or uh, more identifiable hash of that string, which we can then, you know, will be used to block your request. So this one has this grease here. So let's have a look and see what that is. So grease is Google's way of of, uh, was, was Google's way of trying to fix some incompatibility issues with a TLS uh, within their browser. So this cipher here is only ever found within Chrome browsers or Chrome based browsers. So if you send a request that doesn't have this, you're immediately gonna stick out and you're going to get your request blocked for most sites that have this enabled. Another thing that's worth looking at here is the actual way that the JA3 is implemented, and this is the repo um, from Salesforce. We could look through all of this. Uh, it tells you here's some like you know fingerprints for standard clients, for malware, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and it can be used that way. Here's how it's constructed. The SSL version, the ciphers available, and also all this information here, and it leads you to this, okay? So then this is then turned into that MD5 hash, which can be then compared. Uh, the JA3S S is the same thing, but on the server side, um, we're not really gonna look at that at the moment. So all this information is used to fingerprint you. So if we go over to uh, this one here, we can see there's a, on the fingerprint.com website, it talks a little bit about uh, how it works, how it came about, uh, what we just looked for again, and the MD5. It talks about the benefits, but it also talks about the limitations. And this is what we're gonna focus on, but in just a minute, because I wanna show you something else first, and that's 
HTTP2 fingerprinting. Now with HTTP2, and I found this, this report here from uh, Akamai, which is a very interesting read, um, it's the new protocol, so all your browsers are going to use this, and again, there's more information available that can be used. Now what uh, this company has done is that they use the HTTP2 fingerprint to go ahead and pull extra information, this information here, settings frame, window update frame, and the priority frame. This is then turned into their own hash. So websites that use this absolutely have to use HTTP2 because your HTTP2, HTTP 1. Point whatever version is 1.1 will just straight out fail this test every time. So this is worth, you know, worth keeping an eye on and worth understanding. And I think if I go back to my hashes here and scroll down, I don't know if it had the Akamai hash, it does. So you can see that this one does have it. And again, this one has it too. So this was worked out from the settings, the, uh, this, here's the frame. Um, frame settings that we looked at, frame type, window update, and et cetera, et cetera. Again, this information is different on my HTTP X request, and this will then be transferred into their own sort of their own way of checking in their own database, and you'll probably get stopped here too. So how do we get round it? Well, on this article again, it talks about the limitations of JA3, which is obviously a very interesting read. So when we're trying to get around this, we need to understand not only how it works, which is what we just looked at, but also how that hash is then used to check things. Now, obviously, the more information that is given inside that hash, inside that JA3 string, that's taken from all those things that we looked at gives more away to what your uh, what your request type is and what it's come from, i.e. Python or Go or whatever. So the idea being is that we want to mimic the most um, uh, the most common browsers available so and give them as little information or just enough information so it looks like we're coming from this browser so it gives you a pass rather than you know blocking you straight away. So this is worth a read uh, if you want to have a look through and understand a little bit more. Uh, it talks more about how it works here. Now it does mention somewhere down here curl impersonate so I've got the github repo up for that here and it's, it's quite a popular repo. It's a you know updated version or a patched version of curl for making network requests and and you can actually you know, send the, uh, the, the, it will cover up the ciphers and et cetera, et cetera, and it will mimic a proper request, which gives you that kind of like extra chance of you know, beating that request and getting into the, to the server and whatever you're trying to do from there. Uh, and it's worth giving this a go and having a look and understanding how it all works, it talks about what versions it can mimic. Again, you know, they're not all of them, so we're like, we're way up in like 1.127, I think, for Chrome now. But still, you know, these are popular versions of these browsers. They're not gonna, you know, you don't, you can't just block everybody that uses Chrome 116. So it's not that big a deal, or it hasn't been in my, in my opinion, in my use case. But obviously we can't use this within Python. Um, what I want to show you is the Go uh, TLS client. Um, this is kind of what a lot of the um, a lot of the Python libraries are built on because this guy provides uh, Python bindings, I believe. Um, and it talks again about how it works and how to use it within Go. And you know, but we're really interested in the Python version. So the one that I've been using the most is called Curl CFFI. And if you've been in my Discord, you've probably seen me talking about it or mentioning it. But of course, there are other ones too. Um, this is the one that I'm going to show you working now. Now, this and other other like some of the more modern um, Python scraping libraries um, like H requests also build upon this one from uh, the Bogdafin TLS client. And if I come to the detailed documentation here and go down to standalone, or is it uh, shared library? Here we are. So if we go to Python and we have examples, you'll see um, we can go to this part of the library. Uh, where is it? I'm interested. There was one other bit that I wanted to see community projects. So you can see that it talks, so there's a few um, community projects for Python, and these are worth checking out. Um, I've used a couple of these to, rec to good success, but again, the one that I use is curl CFFI. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back here and I'm going to open up, instead of uh, my HTTPX one, we're going to look at the curl impersonate one, and we're going to come down and we'll compare again. So but this has come from, the one on the right has come from curl impersonate, uh, or curl CFFI rather, and we can see right away 
that we, we were impersonating Chrome. We have that Grease TLS cipher, which is going to be important. We have the good user agent, HTTP2, of course. And you can see this matches much, much closer. And we could even scroll down, and a lot of this is very, very similar. So what we're doing is we're basically just impersonating as much of the information on the left from the real Chrome browser as possible on the right-hand side. And if we come to, you have like, um, let's, let's have a look at the, um, yeah, so we can see that we've even got mostly matching here settings. This is for the Akamai HTTP2 um, fingerprinting. These are all very, very similar here, look, you can see. And so this is a very, very good way of doing it. Now, now generally I don't use this until I need it, but it's worth knowing about. I always say web scraping is knowing how to do lots of different things and understanding where they're gonna fit in and where they can help you. And if you wanna watch me actually using it to success and scraping sites with it, you wanna watch the last video I made, which I'm gonna link here, which shows how I needed to use Curl CFFI to um, spoof my, J my TLS fingerprint to get a good JA3 hash to scrape a website.